Fasten your seatbelts. The foremost authority on 9-11. The best-selling author of methodical illusion. And a researcher extraordinaire. Rebecca Roth is about to step up to the microphone and launch into Reality Check, where the light will shine brightly upon the truth. Live from Oakland, California, at the shadow of Oracle Arena, it's the Rebecca Roth Show, starring Rebecca P. Roth, and I'm your host, <laughs> Ramjet. Is the P for pajamas? <laughs> All right, well, hey... <laughs> Oakland, California. Well, that's going to always be an exciting area. Okay, uh, well, welcome to the Rebecca Roth Show. I'm so glad you could figure it all out. All this technology, isn't it great? You can be anywhere in the world and do a radio show with somebody. I know I did one with uh, Chip Tatum, and I think he was in uh, Colombia or someplace. I'm like, Colombia? Um, someplace in South America, I forgot now. But um, and then I've done a bunch of them um, with Australia. And so it's kind of cool, actually, what the technology will allow you to do. Um, let's see here. Next week, oh. I'm going to Lower Slobovia. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask about that. Okay, so um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, remind myself to do, write myself a note. What are we going to talk about today? So you know. And if you're not interested in this, you can flick it off right now. Um, but what we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about 9-11. And I'm actually going to put it in the title. And for those of you that are listening on YouTube, please go to the Vimeo channel or go to BehindTheGalleyCurtain.com. And then there's links uh, to everywhere uh, in the description box below. And you can follow along there because YouTube's already uh, taken three years worth of videos. And I'm in the middle of getting this last book out. Or I should say next book. Um... And I just don't have time to upload everything, and there it, it's very time-consuming to do. There's a bunch of them oh, that I did get um, some of the more hand-picked ones I thought were, you know, more informative on the Vimeo channel. So you can go uh, click over there, or you can go and there's free. There are some free pages on Behind the Galley Curtain, which is our membership site. Now, if you really got, if you're really interested in 9/11, and you can handle the truth, and I, I'm not here to. Uh, babysit you, placate you, put a pacifier in your mouth, and tell you what you want to hear. But if you think you can handle the truth, there's some interviews and there's some information that goes a little bit further in depth into what I've uncovered and what other airline people that have joined me have uncovered about 9-11, how it happened, who did it, how it got uh, funneled out to you, how they discredited anybody, how they're still out there trying to discredit people that are really doing this kind of research. And I think when you come to Behind the Galley Curtain as a member and you get in and you listen to that, you'll understand why there are people that are, um, I'm assuming, paid by the government. I don't know, maybe they're just a nasty trolls that are out there making claims. I mean, they have claimed I'm 40 different people. It's insanity, but I'm not going to let it stop me. And there's a reason for that, because there's so much valid information that has come forward uh, to me. And so, um, you know, I'm just going to keep putting it out there. Uh, but I think you'll figure it all out. I, and you'll know who they are by the trash they talk, I guess we'll say. So if you haven't become a member at uh, Behind the Galley Curtain, I welcome you to join us over there after this book is out and uh available for everybody then I'm going to change some things I'm going to make it a little bit more interactive so that I can spend more time there I'm not on any social media now uh, that I'm just doing our daily news show and what we do is we're keeping everybody abreast and there's I don't know maybe a dozen days worth and then they go away there's no archive I'm looking at uh, creating some kind of playback so that if you just want to go and listen to the old news a month or two back, maybe two back, three back, or whatever, um, that as a member, you can go do that. I'm just, I just don't have time to do it right now, but I know that the uh, technology is out there, so we can do that. So some people that join up, they want to hear the daily news or we talk about something and we'll reference it, but if you weren't a member, then you don't know we've taken something apart, like currently what's going on with the Trump-Russia um, collusion story and what we're happening. So what we're going to talk about today is kind of wrapping around some of that in comparison with 9-11, the FBI and the CIA and how they work together 
And I, I bet by the end of this show, you'll even be able to see that there are people on the internet that claim to be lawyers, professors, and the like, that claim to be truthers, ooh, some architects even, uh, that are, are actually being paid to discredit airline people. And so everybody said, where, where are all the airline people? Well, you know what? <laughs> They're right here, right behind me. Uh, and I'll take the guff for them. You know why? Because just like the aft galley uh, job in a 747, somebody's got to do that dirty job. So I've been elected for a time such as this, and I'm going to continue to do it. Nobody is going to stop me. Nobody. Nobody. Absolutely nobody. So uh, we also have, now just uh, get this stuff, this commercial out of the way. The membership's on sale for 30% off. You can find how to get the 30% discount. And if you click the button to renew your uh, monthly, quarterly, six monthly, yearly membership, it'll renew at that price. Okay. So you just need to put in 30% tells you exactly how to do it. Hit the red button, hit the apply button, put it in there where the little white spot is for your discount code. And then um, it'll do the math for you. And then you can proceed through and pay with your credit card, debit card, whatever, um, PayPal. Um, and you don't have to use PayPal. You can use a credit card. Uh, I don't accept checks in the mail because I don't have a mailbox. And there's a reason for that. You're going to learn about that in book four. Um, so I just, if you're in a situation where you just absolutely can't afford it and you're dying to come in, well, we can make uh, something happen for you. Just contact me in email. That's not a problem at all. Um, and then also, if you become a member, uh, as a paid member, you get a 15% discount on the books. And the first three books are on sale still, $39 in the U.S., U.S. dollars, free shipping in the U.S. If you're outside the United States, you do need to contact the publisher because our Square store does great stuff, but it doesn't do international postage. Why? Because it varies from $13 to $30, and depending upon where you are. So um, what we do is just charge you the straight postage, whatever, or probably a little bit less. Uh, to get the books to you uh, if, if you're international. You just need to make that arrangement with the a publisher, and his email is on the store, uh, so you can uh, go find that. It'll just, you'll just look for the international orders information or just the publisher's uh, email, or you can email me and I'll send it to you. That's fine too. And you can find my information on all the websites that are listed in the description box. And the publisher is offering free postage to Lower Slobobia this week. <laughs> Watch out now. Okay. Um, so let's see. That's enough of the business stuff. And I know some people hate it, but some people are just full of hate. Isn't it weird? It is just weird. I just don't understand how it is that somebody uh, can be so full of hate as some people are. It's just bizarre. Um, but that's the way people are. And if you're a hater, get out of here. We don't even want you around. And anyway, if you do uh, come into the uh, behind the galley curtain, there is no hate allowed. In the chat room, you'll be booted. Uh, it, it's just ridiculous to put up with people like that. So. So we don't. But what's happened uh, now, I, for a while, I was able to spend most of Saturdays in the chat room, which was really fun. But um, I, I'm just in a more intense time right now. So I, I'm not there as often. I go in there every day and uh, in the morning, usually on the, let's say, Pacific time morning and post the daily news show, which runs 30 to 40 minutes. And um, so I'm in there and I'll announce when the show has been put up and stuff. Um, if you have questions, you can always email me because it's you can contact me through there. It's easy to do. So, okay, now getting back to the to the show. Sorry, it took so long to get through that, but what I <clears throat> what I've been doing lately is you know we've been doing these daily shows on um, the FBI, Jim Comey, uh, John Brennan of the CIA, James Clapper, and all of these people, and and what's been going on with the Trump colluding with Russia scenario that the uh, intelligence community created. And why do I say that? Because the colluders were John and Tony Podesta. And if you look up Podesta group, it's still probably available on Wikipedia. Because even though they've um, nuked their company, there's still information about them in the archives. They had a great Wikipedia page. Uh, and you can probably find that 
<clears throat> so you can see who their customers were. They were the biggest lobbyist firm, the most powerful lobbyist firm in the, in the United States and Washington, D.C., for over 20 years. And their biggest customers were Russians and Russian government-owned banks and other businesses, energy businesses and the like. Now, John Podesta ran Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign. So there's a little colluding going on. And if you know anything about anything, you know about the Uranium One sale, where as the Secretary of State, Hillary and Bill Clinton colluded with Russians, Putin and others, to uh, do a purchase of 20% of the United States uranium and get it run through the CFIUS courts and get it approved. She was one of the people that voted to approve this. So were the top, I think, nine uh, administrative people in Obama's administration. Now, Bill Clinton got almost $200 million for doing uh, this deal and got $500,000 just for doing a half-hour uh, speech or 20-minute speech in Russia and then met with Vladimir Putin. This was around 2010. So there's collusion. There are some more. But for some reason, I, I bet you can figure out what it is, Robert Mueller, who was hired, now you got to understand who everybody is. Robert Mueller was hired by Rod Rosenstein. Rod Rosenstein's uh, wife is a, one of Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton's attorneys. So there's all that kind of collusion going on. We won't get into it too much, but just to touch on this, so you can see what's happening now. Just Friday, it has finally come out after nearly two years of the president, Donald J. Trump, learning that he was, quote, wiretapped. Well, in today's technology, wiretap's an old terminology. You don't tap anybody's phone. People don't have landlines hardly anymore. But it's an old terminology. It's an outdated terminology, but he is older. And so he, you know what he means when he says he was wiretapped? He was, he was basically being listened to or spied upon, right? And so the deep state, who did not want him, who did everything they could through the media, all of it, to promote Hillary Clinton, even they had the voting machines rigged, uh, not just the media and not just the deep state and not just in the United States. And so what I want to talk about is if you've read Methodical Conclusion, you know what I'm about to say to you, that chip is based on a real person and chip told us that his cia handler told him that all intelligence agencies work together and so what are we looking at we're looking at the collusion of the fbi and the cia and the mi6 and the mossad and Ital in, in this current thing, we're looking at the Italian um, uh, intelligence as well with the whole Russian collusion thing. What did we just see? The same thing that happened on 9-11. The same people colluded, the FBI, the CIA, MI6. Remember the Antonov aircraft into Mojave with the gold? Yep, British pilots. How does that happen? Well, I actually got con contacted by someone that uh, no longer works with uh, the GCHQ, MI5, MI6, and in British intelligence. And why? Because he had just read Methodical Conclusion. He actually read all three books. But in Methodical Conclusion, there was actually eyewitnesses to the gold being pulled out of those vaults in the World Trade Center towers months before, weeks before 9-11 uh, happened. And it was taken somewhere, and there were eyewitnesses to this. And so, and the air traffic controllers that heard this heavy lift aircraft, yeah, if those of you who know what I'm talking about know, are listening, um, they reported to me that the pilots were British. Well, how do we know that? Because they all sound like Richard Quest, right? <laughs> and Pierce Morgan. <laughs> so... Um, okay, so we got the MI5 there. We all know that Mossad was involved because we had the Mossad uh, Israeli art students living there. We had other people connected to Israel living there, working there, owning there, getting people involved, etc. Well, that person from GCHQ that contacted you, he was rather surprised that you knew they were uh, British pilots that were flying that plane. In fact, I think he was flabbergasted, I think was the right word. 
Actually, he was flabbergasted. <laughs> but what's been interesting to me is that in doing the YouTubes and, and sharing and writing the books, uh, I, I was surprised that he had gotten the books over in the UK. But he had. And now, of course, he, he was working, uh, started work at uh, GCHQ uh, right after 9-11, just like a whole bunch of Sabelle Edmonds after 9-11. You know, we, we want those people that were working there before 9-11 or during 9-11. Those are the people that know if you just came in after the fact, a lot of stuff changed right away, including with the airlines. But one of the things I've also uh, been doing with this fourth book is comparing 302s because during this uh, Trump-Russia FBI thing with all of these hearings coming out in the Congress and, and Senate intelligence hearings, is I didn't know that the FBI 302s, it's illegal to change them until, <laughs> well, until uh, I heard that as part of this Russia Trump thing and the FBI people going forward. And we read in the Peter Strzok Lisa Page text messaging that they changed Michael Flynn's 302s and they were afraid of getting caught because you can't change those. Oh, I didn't know that. But let me tell you this. They changed a lot of them around 9-11. Uh, they changed a lot of them. And Betty Ong's in particular, her four and a half minutes, uh, there were a lot of things that were eventually deleted from her original. Now, I found the original uh, FBI with everything in it. And then I, what, this is what kind of red flagged me, is that later on I found another one, and I started printing them up, uh, that was... Uh, a shorter rendition where they left some things out. You know, Betty Ong said something, she said some things that, you know, really caught my eye. And that's kind of how I realized that they were on the ground and it wasn't really a hijacking. And she was doing kind of what we do in Methodical Illusion, you will read how we look at our recurrent yearly training. Because every year, every flight attendant in the United States has to be uh, recertified. In order to do that, you have to spend so many hours studying FAA rules, uh, s protocols for hijacking, for evacuations, commands. If you get on Southwest Airlines or you get on Delta or you get on American and there's something that's going on, you're going to hear the flight attendants, every one of them barking the same order. And let me just give you an example of that. Um Years ago, there was a United plane that crashed because it ran out of fuel near Portland, Oregon, outside of the uh, airport area. And when the lead flight attendant up at door one on the left side, we call it one left, opened her door. Her door was armed with a chute so you can slide on out, right? There was about a three foot, two foot in diameter evergreen tree. After that... Uh, now, every time there's a crash or an incident, the crews get together with the FAA and the company, and they go over, well, what happened? When you opened your door, and that's when commands change. And this is the command that happened. So if you were on an airplane... So what happened when she opened her door? Well, what happened when she opened her door was a disaster because this is the door that everybody came into. So psychologically, this is the door that everybody wants to get out of. So it's your natural response is to get out the door you came in because you don't see the other doors that open. Even though we point them out to you, you don't see them. So that psychologically, you go to that door. Her chute opened up and pinned her against the galley door. So basically the two front doors, I think that was a 727. I can't remember for sure. Um, but it, there's a door in the galley for the uh, galley people open up and it's an exit also and it's armed with a chute but her chute unfolded inside pinning her into the galley up against the other door so then two doors didn't work uh, because of that after that the FAA said oh before you open your door especially with your chutes armed <laughs> which they are when when you push back from the airplane you see the flight attendants arm the doors uh, flight attendants say, oh, flight attendants uh, arm your doors for departure uh, and that's what they're doing. They're hooking up the chutes. And they uh, actually uh, happen in very different ways. There's a little stainless steel bar that hooks to a hook on the floor. Or there's inside of the newer aircraft, there's just a, a, a switch you flip or a um, 
a little knob that you push and it'll arm your door. So there's different ways. You won't always see them go down there getting their fingernails dirty by um, pushing that uh, stainless steel bar onto the hook down on the floor. But that's how the, some of them do connect still. The older or older aircraft, I guess. So what happens? So, okay, you're you're landing and you go off the runway and there's something blocking a door. We got this command, exit, blocked, go back. And you'll see the flight attendants, I don't care what airline this is, because they've all been taught to do the same thing, just like we were with the hijacking. They will make a cross with their forearms above their head and be shouting from that area, exit, blocked, go back, over and over and over again. So you don't come that way because it's vitally important that you get off the airplane right away. So go back. They and they may push their hands and like we show you where the bathrooms are, or where the window exits are with our little hand signals. Well, go back, go back, exit blocked, go back, and that's the command that we got from that United crash. And so that's kind of how the FAA has worked all along over the years. Is when there's an incident, we learn from it. That's what they, you know, they say. We're we're not proactive, <laughs> we're we're reactive. So that's how we get commands. And then everybody every year at their recurrent training, and we all hate it. We talked about this. Uh, we've talked about this before, but it's in methodical illusion uh, how they dread going. It's a long. It's an eight to t- ten hour day of your time plus a workbook that you have to do on your own personal time. But you have to recertify every year. And we also do uh, not just airplane hijacking and uh, that stuff, but we also do the first aid stuff. And we, um, as we got defibrillators on board, which I think every plane has now, we were all qualified to use the automatic defibrillators that are on the aircraft. So um, it, uh, that along with, you know, lots of other stuff, how to get uh, everybody off the plane, you know, the, new, the commands. And, and we have... Um, step-by-step protocol to follow not just for hijacking for planned emergencies and we have little memory joggers that we remember what to do first second third fourth and fifth to get you ready to get you off the plane um, safely so anyway back to the collusion on 9-11 now you know I have this Freedom of Information Act data it's always amazing to me (laughs) that people call themselves truthers but they don't have any data And they don't have any experience. So what do you have? A theory, a conspiracy theory, and because you have no data. But I'm a a science person. I'm a collective collector of data. So now lately I've been collecting all these 302s, and I'm finding because I know so much about this. I've dug so far into this. um, I've flown the flight plans (laughs) on Google Earth. I've mapped them out on Sky Vector and flown basically where those planes were exactly when the transponders went off. I mean, it, I, I, this is embedded in me. So when I read new 302s or I find them, which I just did actually not long ago, and I read stories that I know now, because what we do know for a fact now is that there were not any 19 Arab hijackers on board those four planes. We know that for a fact. Now, I won't go into it too much right now, but trust me, we know it for a fact. You're going to get it in book four, so I won't, I won't bother you with it now. But we do know for a fact that there weren't 19 Arabs on board, but this also explains why Betty Ong said, I don't know, but we might be being hijacked, because when you have a hijacker on board, every crew member knows it immediately. There's something wrong, and there is something that we all have to do immediately. But none of the flight attendants did it. And all of a sudden, as I was reading through these 302s and these stories, again, that keep conflicting with the official stories and other data and radar, and uh, it's amazing. As I'm reading through these stories, I went, oh, wow. Oh, this is interesting. But it's just like recurrent training. Because in recurrent training, we're in a hangar, we're in mock-ups, which are small sections of different aircraft fuselages, like passenger sections, like a zone almost. And it'll be like, maybe there'll be 10 or 12 or 14 rows of old passenger seats. So we're not usually the ones we still use, but uh, it's a mock-up. It's a fake uh, p- piece of a fuselage. There'll, sometimes there'll be emergency exit windows or the uh, tail, win- uh, you know, drop-down stairs or... 
There'll be the regular door, the aircraft door itself, because in that mock-up, we can do lots of different things. There's even, we, there's even mock-ups that create black smoke. Now, if you saw the plane crash in Cuba uh, yesterday, you saw what happens. The, everything inside an airplane that's plastic is going to put out toxic black smoke. And so we have smoke goggles used to be years ago, but now we have actual mock-ups that, that fill that mock-up cabin um, with a smoke that you can't, it just uh, emanates what it's going to be like if your plane catches on fire on a crash. So that's the kind of stuff we do in these mock-up things. And all of a sudden, I was, I was reading through these 302s and these stories, and I realized that the only way a flight attendant would not know she was in a hijacking. Now, keep in mind, this is, um, uh, it's probably almost four minutes into her phone call that she says this, that she's complaining to a reservation agent, which is, and she's not in our loop for security. Uh, she's complaining to somebody that the pass pilots won't answer their phone and they can't get in there and that somebody sprayed pepper sprayer mace up in the front and they can't breathe up front. But she's in the back and she's not having any trouble breathing, so the plane's not pressurized. And she doesn't know for sure, but she thinks they might be being hijacked. But she doesn't know for sure. That's what she says. These are her words, not mine. And so when I took all of the 302s that I could find, and I think I've got three different renditions of them, and looked at what the FBI took out or changed in Betty Ong's four and a half minute uh, taped transcript, it showed me a lot of stuff. Now, what I found in the whole overall thing is that the Central Intelligence Agency and the Israeli Mossad and the MI6 out of the UK were all involved in some aspect of 9-11. Now, don't forget, this wasn't just a fake hijacking like Operations North, Operation Northwoods. Look that up. And that was a CIA um, plan as well from the 60s. It never happened. But it's so close to 9-11 you can see that it's just, 9-11 is basically Operation Northwood improved, or so they thought. So what we had then, if you look and read any of the information, is the FBI, and we had groups like Able Danger in the Pentagon and uh, Bill Biney at the Thin Thread at, at the NSA, and they actually were, they had the ability to find the fake hijackers. Yeah, the guys that, that were out with Jack Abramoff on his gambling yacht right before 9-11, those good fundamental Muslims like Mohammed Atta, several of them used Deborah Paltry's uh, escort service in Washington, D.C., associated with Jack Abramoff, the lobbyist, the Jewish American lobbyist. Yeah. So, you know, you're going to believe the media when they tell you that these fundamental Muslims that hate us for our freedom were out gambling with a Jew? <laughs> and using a hooker that he recommended, or an escort, they call them over there. I mean, seriously. Um, so I, anyway, I found some really interesting things, but what, what I find that's, that's going along with today's situation is what we have with the Trump-Russia collusion is we have the Central Intelligence Agency and all of the others involved, like the FBI, that are trying to cover something up. What are they trying to cover up? Well, they're trying to cover up Obama and, and Hillary and their collusion with Russian businesses. And they all associate with people that associate with the MI6 and the FSB or KGB, the new KGB, Russian intelligence. And so if you look at this with all your eyes open and not just looking at it to be a political hack, and you see the truth, it's just like with 9-11. The 9-11 Commission, according to Thomas Keene, was set up to fail. But look who was on the commission. Of course it was, because they were all people that were heavily invested into the military-industrial complex and the war and greater Israel. There's several things that were going on with the 9-11 Commission. But what we had then is the FBI going around covering up a fake hijacking. Just like right now, the FBI 
And you can see they're politicized because all you have to do is read Peter Strzok and Lisa Page and see how badly they hate. They hated everybody except Hillary Clinton in their text messages to each other that we can read. So they, you have a, uh, they're on a mission. Their mission was to destroy Donald Trump. They even now came out last night, they put a spy, and there may be as many as four moles, spies, in his campaign and his transition team, and perhaps even in his White House for a period of time. And they all connect to each other. If, I mean, that's what we've been doing on The Daily Show. We've just been connecting all of those dots. And it's exactly what happened on 9-11. It's just like the same pattern and I'm a pattern person. I admit it. I put puzzles together. That's why there's puzzle pieces in my covers. Um, but that's what this is again. And like I said, if you go look at the CIA's Operation Northwoods and why they were going to do it, read that. It's unclassified. Now you can find it on the internet. Uh, read what, what they were doing and why they were going to do it. And then look at 9-11. And it's the same thing. And when you get to the end of book four, you will never believe one thing the TV shows you. I would guarantee you that. This is your red pill. Now, I'm, <laughs> I have a, a reader that has been emailing me that just finished Methodical Illusion and couldn't wait. And she bought all, got all three books. I couldn't wait to read Methodical Deception. She's about halfway or three quarters of the way through that now. No, she's almost, uh, she, she thought you'd be oh, ending it like the last night or so. And immediately starting on Methodical Conclusion. I, I have to tell you that the things that we uncovered, and this is really when uh, book two was out and people started really coming forward and we started going through the data. And the data that's out there, they literally flooded uh, the data. Now, I have a, a terabyte of Freedom of Information Act data that somebody else got that I got from, from them. And it's, uh, you know, if you want it, you can get it at, at the bookstore, at our online store. Uh, it, it has to be put into an external hard drive because it's just too much information. But it's what the federal government releases when somebody wants all the FOIA data and that they can request uh, about 9-11. And what's in there is mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. So this is the stuff that the real aviation experts, besides flight attendants and the, you know, the pilots and the flight attendants, but air traffic controllers and other people that have been involved in various uh, things, everything from intelligence, uh, DEA to DARPA. Okay, so lots of people have come forward with lots of information. I try to put it in the book in a way that's uh, entertaining for you and that's easy to digest and understandable because some of it's complex. Some of it's very, very, and it's too complex to even put in a novel, some of it. But trust me, there's plenty of information in there, and I think it all comes together pretty well. But one of the things we uncovered in the FOIA data, and I've talked about this before, but it isn't just one file. And in the back of Methodical Deception, there's a appendix. In the back of book four, I'm going to have something similar to that, uh, which is like the nonfiction part, right? So you can kind of get the story and how did all of this get uncovered? And then I just created the novels and the characters. Um, but in the FOIA data, it's really interesting because once we discovered that the we have some planes we're going back to the airport that guy who they labeled before anything happened at 6 37 a.m on 9 11 in the faa headquarters in washington dc's computer system an hour and a half before flight 11 even pushed back from the gate the meta tagging, when you save a document on a computer, it tags it. Now, for me, now I have, all my computers aren't, aren't named me. My computers have different girls' names. I have a pink one I called her Barbie. Uh, I don't remember if I gave her a last name. But uh, it will mark your who you are if, if need be. Not all of them have authors attached to them, but some of them do. Some of these files were authored by MITRE people. Uh, and if you've read the books, you know who they are. Uh, and if you have an M-I-T-R-E, look it up in Wikipedia. So you understand why the NIST report came out as phony as it did, because they're just a subsidiary of MITRE. MITRE is also in, involved with 
MIT, who was also very involved with 9-11. Because MIT and uh, the FAA worked together on the radar systems. So what did we find in the meta tags? There literally are, well, I can't even say, I, there's so many files in there that's just ridiculous. I can't even say hundreds, thousands, I won't say that. Let's say, well, I, they can say probably be a, make it be a hundred files, I guess. I'm not, it's just going to ballpark it. Lots of files. Let's just say it that way because then somebody doesn't have to have a coronary over. You said hundred. How could you spend, how could you spend a thousand hours? Oh, well. <laughs> I guess you'd have to live with me. Okay, so what do we find in the meta tag when you save this document into the FAA headquarters? They save these documents. And then later on, they, they come out. They were tagged with meta tags of time stamps and date stamps. And a lot of the files we're finding, because now we're just looking how many of these can we find that are supposed to be the radar of these four planes. But there were going to be six planes, remember, that these routes supposedly that they sent to hill air force base in utah with their aids 84 yeah this is what happened uh-huh well i got news for you how in the hell did you know that anything was going to happen to flight 93 which crashed somewhere around 10 a.m at five in the morning on 9 11 how did you know that but that's when it was uploaded into the faa headquarters computer system it was tagged with a timestamp and a date stamp. Yeah, you'll see it if you look at the FOIA data. All of you 9-11 truthers that have the FOIA data, take a look at properties when you click on a file. And go take a look and see when, it's, when it was, a mod, it'll say modified, but that's actually when it was created. That's, they just call it modified. But you're going to see that. And so what I started doing is looking through this nearly a terabyte of, of data that I have looking for an original, real bit of radar from 8 a.m. until those phone calls started somewhere around 8.20. So really what you're saying is the uh, CIA and the FBI, in their attempt to cover all this stuff up, have made up stuff and that ha they have used to substantiate the official story, which was BS to begin with. Exactly. That's mm. exactly right. And that's what they're doing right now with the Trump collusion thing. Trump did not collude with Russia. He didn't need their money. That's not, they've looked in it. Listen, they've had as many as four moles inside the transition team, the campaign, the White House. You mean it's what they're doing when Clapper's trying to cover his scrapper? Yeah, right now he's saying, well, yes, we have a spy we had a spy in there just to protect the president. But you'll remember that Donald Trump, through the campaign, had his own, and because he did before he even ran, he had his own private security. And then they gave him secret service. So he had both. And why, if they did that, why did they never tell him they put a spy in there? What they were looking for was something that they could twist. And what they found is George Papadopoulos and Carter Page, and Professor Mif Sood, um, Mif, Miss Food, I can never remember how to say his name, uh, and uh, Stefan Halper are all related to the MI6. These are all people that work for the MI6, the Mossad, the CIA, and the FBI. Christopher Steele, who's the Steele dossier, right? He's MI6 and FBI. Uh, Carter Page was an FBI informant. Uh, George Papadopoulos w worked with Hillary Clinton and others associated with her. The uh, uh, downer from Australia, the Five Eyes guy, right? He is in bed with the Clinton Foundation and MI6 and the FBI. Uh huh. So the FBI and the CIA are working together to destroy the presidency of the United States of America. Right now we have an ongoing, soon-to-be-busted coup attempt by the FBI and the CIA. Now, if you keep that in your mind as you're looking at or reading the books and understanding or listening to the videos, whatever you like to do, 
Uh, I know some people don't read. Some people have asked me, uh, will there be an audiobook after this fourth book comes out? I might, I might do the reading myself. A lot of people have asked me to, so I may uh, end up putting them out in audiobooks later, so you can listen to them. Uh, but right now, there's a lot of uh, if there's a lot of research. There's a lot of writing, and then there, you got to go through and read it all and make sure you put everything in there and you put it in so that people can understand it. Because like I said, some of this information, and I know for me being in, in the airline, we have our own language. And you can see if I'm talking in the chat room with somebody, we'll start talking in almost a code because we never will spell out Chicago. We'll write O-R-D. I mean, we'll never spell out Miami. It's M-I-A. We, that's kind of how we do stuff. But we do that with other things, lots of other things. <clears throat> Whether we're talking about uh, management or supervisors, they they all everything comes with a code like F A A F A R S, right? So we start doing that, and I look back now, and I can remember uh, a, a people trying to understand what a group of us were talking about. We were just in our in our own code language, and that and that happens. So I'm kind of I try not to do that, but if I do it, I try to explain it to the reader so that you understand what what's going on I don't want you to be left in the dark and that's the way I'm with everything I found an interesting story the other day looking remember Mohammed Atta's parents both claimed uh, and I think they were uh, separate I think they were divorced or living separate countries I'm not positive but right after 9-11 some uh, I think there were reporters from the UK tried to contact his parents and it wasn't that hard to do Remember that most uh, Operation Mockingbird, most journalists are connected to the CIA or the Mossad, so it's not that hard for them to find you. And they're not they're not that hard to, for you to them to find Mohammed Atta's parents, which they did. And they said that they spoke to him. I think the father said the day after on September twelfth, and the mother. I think it was the mother that said, "If you want to know where he is." Ask the Israeli Mossad, because that's who he works for. But he's still alive, as are 10 of them. And the other nine were most likely completely fictional fictional characters, made up, just grabbed a first name and a last name from somebody. And that's why the FBI and the CIA say, well, very little is known about, yeah, right, of course, (laughs) because he isn't real. That's why. And so when you start to understand how all of this happened and you can start to see through, for me, I think the see-through part was that I I used my flight attendant ears and eyes, and that's very intimidating to some 9-11 troopers. So what was the interesting story you heard the other day? Oh, I I was actually reading this in in an FBI 302 story about a pilot who brought in the aircraft that turned around as Flight 11 from Boston, and she got in at 6.50 in the morning and claimed that she met Mohammed Atta at the end of the jetway. And there's a problem with that story because Mohammed Atta flew in on Colgan Airline or Colgan Air, it was called at the time. They are since gone now. Um, Flight 5930. And uh, of so far of all of the radar data, and I have a lot of it, all of the pertinent information on Colgan 5930 has been pretty well scrambled. But the official story would like you to believe that they came in on, on time. And if they did, they landed at 645. And guess what? They, they landed at the other end of the airport. So Mohammed Atta, according to uh, Hi- History Commons and to the Terror Timeline book and to all the other part of the official story, didn't get to the gate until 7.30, and at 7.30, they'd already closed the cargo area for your luggage. So remember what Mohammed Atta had that couldn't get on the plane? His luggage. Remember what was in it? His will and testament, right? Because, of course, if you're going to crash a plane into a skyscraper, you'd want to burn up your will and testament by bringing it in your carry-on baggage. Huh, Right? Okay, he also had some flight manuals from the uh, 767, 747, something else. Um, And flight manuals are usually uh, like three inches thick. They're kind of like a squatty phone book. If you've got the terror timeline, they're about that size, that book. And so 
I'm thinking, well, who do you, who do you, who did she see? <laughs> because there's no way that at 6:50 when she was deplaning after the passengers got off uh, her flight, and uh, even if she was there at seven o'clock. He, uh, he couldn't get to the gate yet because he didn't get to the gate, according to the gate agents, till 7.30, and that's why his luggage didn't get put on. But if you'll remember, the real story about Mohammed Atta is that the American flight attendants all know him. The senior flight attendants knew who that guy was by name, and he was a million-mile passenger on American Airlines. Okay, so if that were if that's true and I've had lots of flight attendants tell me that I've been flying around 30 years. Okay, so then say if that's true, then here's let me just give you an inside track. The, why didn't the, anybody at American Airlines look up this guy by his frequent flyer card? Was he on the plane? Is he on the manifest? Was he even there? What did this p- pilot see? Okay, so so here's the rest of the pilot story. And this is in an FBI 302. She called the FBI to give them this story after she got to Boston and went to, or I think she went to a hotel. But she was so tired because she'd done an all-nighter and you know been up all day the day before. Uh, she fell asleep when she got home. Let's say she got home around 7.30 and slept till around 1.30 in the afternoon and woke up and uh talked to her parents. I don't know if they called her and woke her up or if she woke up for some reason. And uh, then she turned on the television and saw what had happened. Then she realized that was the airplane that she had brought in and parked at that gate that became Flight 11. And so she contacted the FBI to tell them what time she got there and that she saw Mohammed Atta and that he asked her, are you going to fly that plane out? She was just getting off an incoming flight. All of that story is a lie. Because so, Muhammad Atta wasn't there until 7.30. Muhammad Atta wasn't there, period. That's true. <laughs> okay, I could have counted on you to say that. So yeah, in the fact of the matter is, now that we know so many people that were working for the CIA and not just flight attendants, not just pilots, well, you got to ask yourself, was she looking for 15 minutes of fame was she an agent also working with the cia just like the other pilots were was what was the reason she would make up an outright lie and then tell us that this guy mohammed atta that she saw his picture she says in her story in the 302 she says that uh, she saw his picture by one in the afternoon. Now, I don't recall their pictures being out that early. I got to go check that and see exactly what time they busted that. Because just so you know this, the original story that they ended up planting on Mohammed Atta, where he rented a car in Boston and drove up to Portland, Maine, and then barely made his flight. Remember, that's why his luggage didn't make it. He didn't get to the gate till 730. And they'd already, the departure time was 745. So they'd already closed up the car, the luggage uh, area, the cargo bay, the luggage bay. So they're not going to open it up again. They just don't. But for a million mile customer, they would have put his plane, his luggage on the plane. And like, take you to your last aircraft flight, your last plane flight, where there was 100 empty seats. There's all kinds of overhead space in a 767 or empty seats with the, you know, the seat in front of them empty even. All kinds of place for a million mile customer's luggage to go. And that's what they would have done with a million mile customer. That's why we know he wasn't there. And that this is just a charade because that's how things work. And the and the real world. And so when you know what you know and you know it, and then you find people that are there lying, but worse yet for that pilot is that we found something much bigger. And we know now who the real hijackers were. And now we know why Betty Ong was so confused about whether she was hijacked or not. Because she wasn't. And it was just like we do. And all the flight attendants that listen to this, I know you're going you're gonna to say, yep, 
Oh, yeah. This is just like what we do in recurrent training. We're not really in a hijacking, right? We're pretending we are. We are going through the step-by-step protocol. What would we do? And this is what I would do. And you talk to an instructor, remember? What would you do? And this is what I would do. And then I would do this. And then I would do this. And what we do is we recite those steps back to an instructor for the FAA hijack protocols. The code names are used that we would even sometimes even be at a flight attendant station or a jump seat station where there's an inner phone, a fake one, you know, we're talking about in these mock-ups in our training, and we would pick up the phone and we would say, I would do this. This is Mrs. Rebecca Roth and then go on with the code word to indicate to the captain that we are, have a hijacker on board that wants in the cockpit, and then everything falls into place. Everything. So, but looking back now after, you know, I retired, and I've gone into all in-depth research into all this, the CIA was behind most of the hijackings in the 60s and early 70s, uh, that were take me to Havana, remember, as part of the way to demonize the Cubans. Remember the Bay of Pigs? If you're not old enough, look it up. Remember Operation Northwoods? This was all the same kind of stuff. Okay, proceed forward to the year 2000. Who was the new enemy target? The Muslims. Okay? Now, here's another interesting thing. In the 302s of the FBI over the probably two to three weeks after, you know, the weeks coming, the two, three, or one, two, or three weeks after, there are interviews on 302s of the FBI of every person who worked at security at Dulles, Newark, and Boston Slogan. Now, here's an interesting tidbit for you. I don't think I read two. I think there's one that sound like Americans, Okay like a Joe Smith kind of name. These were almost all Middle Eastern or African, Somalian, Yemenis, Pakistani, Afghani. There was one, I think, Iranian. And, and there were several from each uh, of those countries. I think there was maybe one from Oman and areas like that. Some of them had been working for the security company which was an offshoot of ICTS from Israel that ran security at all uh, three of those airports. And each one of those people were interviewed. And guess what? None of them saw Mohammed Atta. <laughs> None of them saw uh, anything unusual or people, uh, you know, places where they shouldn't be. But employees at the, from those airlines have seen people that were there the week preceding the event. Those are the people that have the real story. But it's like the FBI didn't want you to know everything. It's kind of like right now with Robert Mueller, who also is the man who sealed away from you the 85 plus cameras around the Pentagon that show that missile. That's Robert Mueller. He's the special counsel trying to take down the president right now. This guy is notorious. I mean, the Whitey Bulger thing, this uh, Robert Mueller put four men to prison for life to protect an FBI informant. Okay, now what did we just talk about? Who were the informants? Carter Page, Stephen Halper, uh, George Papadopoulos. I mean, you see all these people, right? These all pe- are all people that have been uh, confidential informants, CIs, with the FBI. They also work with the CIA and the MI6. Are you starting to see what happened on 9-11 and who the players are and who the players were and who who really was the hijacker now? Yeah. Okay, I think you can see it. Now, for those of you who have read the books, I I know that... um, you're anxious and I I do apologize because but there's a reason and after this book is is out there you're going to know the reason well uh, you will know it Uh, I will share it with you definitely I will share this Um, I'm actually going to set some videos up so as soon as the book is available uh, and you've started reading it I'll I'll post them in behind the galley curtain in the um, for the members only so you'll be the first ones to know um what what the holdup is here and what's going on. 
So there you go. That's enough. That But see, when you start to see the pattern and you look back and you see the FBI and remember, uh, I think her name was Colleen Rowley from Minneapolis uh, FBI. And she had contacted her supervisors that say, well, hang on, there's something really weird going on because there's these Middle Eastern guys. Well, these guys were all set up uh, so that you could these people could come back because there weren't any 19 hijackers on board the planes. Now, there were some patsies, just like with um, Lee Harvey Oswald, there were some patsies that were set out to live with the pink-haired stripper, snort cocaine, drink vodka. That's not stuff that uh, Muslims do. So, and gamble with a Jew (laughs) on his yacht (laughs) with an escort. That's not right. Okay, so... Do you believe that story? Okay. If you believe that story, then you're going to believe that that the Central Intelligence Agency and the FBI had four moles in Donald Trump's campaign just to protect him. Right? Because we have a special counsel, Robert Mueller, who is trying to trap him into perjury because they can't find any evidence. Now, if the fact is that we had one or four moles with Donald Trump through the campaign, through the transition and into the White House, and they still have no evidence of Russian collusion or anything illegal by Donald Trump, then they have nothing. Why is this going on? Because the globalists... Their mercenaries are the FBI and the CIA. These people are the Army, Air Force, Marines, etc. These are the military for the 1% elitist, the globalists, the New World Order pushing. Uh, you know who they are. If you don't get, get into looking up who is behind this, because it, it, is, it goes clear back, I kid you not, to, to the Garden of Eden. This is, this is nothing new. It goes clear back that far. But you need to know that they're there and it's very, very real. And so what you can see then is that same pattern. They don't want to see Hillary Clinton because they're protecting her. They didn't want to see that these patsies were there because they were working for Israel. Mohammed at his parents told us. If you want to know where he is, Ask the Israeli Mossad. That's who he works for. Ziad Jara, who was supposedly on Flight 93, his uncle got arrested in Lebanon for being an Israeli spy. Mossad, yeah. Okay, it's his family thing. So we know what we know what we know. Now it's the red pill time. It is the red pill. Now that I, I have a, already the cover art, <laughs> I wish now I would have just placed a red pill right in front <laughs> because this book, well, actually the whole series, because it, it, what I ended up doing as I, as I uncovered stuff, I had my protagonist Vera Hansen uncovering stuff, and I thought I had figured it out in Methodical Illusion. I'm not even close. Uh, but the end of uh, book four, will absolutely blow your mind. That chapter is written. I don't even need to add it through that one. So anyway, I'm just checking back and uh, get making sure that everything is the way I want it to be for you so that it's understandable and that you get it because it's very, very important. And so just talking about what's going on currently Uh, in conjunction with what happened on 9-11, I know that you'll be able to see that this is the same thing they tried to do, but John F. Kennedy didn't allow it for Operation Northwoods. Okay, that's one reason he's dead. The same kind of stuff, using the patsies. There was a fake guy that looked a lot like um, Lee Harvey Oswald. They sent him to Mexico City. Now we know there were three shooters. I mean, all my lifetime, I was told about the magic bullet and uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. And now that the files have come out, we know who they were. We know where the money was coming from. Uh, it's all there in the, in the newly released files from the JFK files that have been kept from us for you know, 50 years. So putting it all together. And I think that it's important that we do that so it doesn't happen again. And I think now, looking back, if they tried to pull off a 9-11 or any type of event like that right now, what are you going to do? Most people 
are going to fire up. You'll see this because even in airplane uh, decompressions, people fire up their, their iPhone or their smartphone video camera and they start camp videoing. They start filming or they start snapping pictures. That and 9-11 stuff can't happen now. It just, they're they're going to have to be much better than they were. And, you know, when I discovered what I did about uh, 9-11, this was before I discovered the crew was involved. This is when I still thought the 19 hijackers were involved. And how did they live through it is my question. I mean, I was, before I dug through, or all the I say all the veils of, uh, I don't know. It's weird how, how it happens. But once you start to be able to see the truth, it's like you go in steps. And that's kind of what the books did. They, they kind of go in step. And that's why I tell people you should read them in order because it's the same characters and it's really uncovering the stuff. And, and it really basically is kind of uncovering how it happened to me. Uh, how, uh, and I change all the characters and stuff. When people bring me information, uh, you'll never figure out who they are. And, and it isn't about them anyway. It's about the information. And it's just going to be delivered to you in a novel format. And there's going to be um, a, a much more, I think, informative appendix to this last novel. And um, then I'm probably going to move on. I know people want to know what happened when you died. I want to know about it. And I, I, I didn't work it into this uh, fourth book. Uh, I thought about it, but it just didn't seem to fit. So th that might be the next book coming out or... There may be something else. That, there's a lot of eggs planted in book four that could spin off into uh, other books. But uh, for now, this will probably be it. And uh, if I make it through this, then <laughs> I think you'll enjoy it. And it will be your red pill, I guarantee you. Um, so, and, that, and I guess that's what it's all about. If you're going to come and uh, uh, make a splash, you might as well jump into the deep end, right? And so there it is. I laid it all out there. I don't care if it affects, uh, offends your rabbi or your priest or your pilots. <laughs> You're going to get the truth. It ain't going to be pretty. Or your architects. Or your architects. Um, but yeah, you're, it's uh, wowie, wowie, kazawi. So anyway, that's enough for today. And I hope you'll join us over at Behind the Galley Curtain. Um, and just keep following. We'll do uh, an announcement here on YouTube, you know, a little five-minute commercial when book four is out how you can get it what the best price will be and i'm still looking at putting all four of them in a set and doing the best price so you don't have to buy them at 20 dollars a piece at amazon and stuff uh, you can uh, we'll figure out something that you can do if you buy all four of them uh through the online store we'll try to get it as cheap as possible i mean the, it costs the print and the paper and the artwork and all that stuff it costs money to put together but um I'm at this point I just want people to know the truth and this has got to get out there so we'll do what we can to make it as for as affordable as possible for everybody so we'll be back next Saturday hopefully 